You're listening to Talking to Teens, where we speak with leading experts from a variety of disciplines about the art and science of parenting teenagers. I'm your host, Andy Earle. We're here today with Dr. Richard M. Lerner. Dr. Lerner is the author of The Good Teen, Rescuing Adolescents from the Myths of the Storm and Stress Years. Dr. Lerner is a researcher who has been studying the characteristics of successful teens for more than 40 years now at the Institute for Applied Research in Youth Development at Tufts University. He also directs the 4-H Study of Positive Youth Development, and he and his wife conducted the landmark 4-H study. Dr. Lerner's groundbreaking research reveals that everything you think you know about teenagers is wrong. The entire model most of us use to think about adolescents doesn't hold up to science. And his research proves it. Today, we're going to talk about how the teenage brain really works, what is actually going on with teenagers, and what parents need to do to make it go smoothly. Richard, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today. So, Can you talk a little bit about your research and how you got into it? So I began my research career while I was an undergraduate at Hunter College in the Bronx, which is now Lehman College. I'm one of uh, those folks who went from kindergarten to PhD in the public schools of the New York City. And can you see uh, what I have in the background there? We're in my study. Yeah. So there's the famous uh, Steinberg poster of the New Yorker, which shows that was my worldview. And next to it, that's a signed Derek Jeter jersey. That looks like a Yankees jersey to me. Yep. Yeah. So I'm still a New Yorker. (laughs) And I thought I would never leave New York, but needing a job left me, got me uh, over the uh, over the George Washington Bridge and moving to the Midwest. But uh in undergraduate, I thought I was going to be a physiological experimental psychologist. Okay. And then in graduate school, that's how I entered graduate school. But I then became exposed to ideas about child development and in sp- specifically adolescent development. And th- something struck me as completely wrong about the whole field. Hmm. And that was that the model was adolescents are in a period of storm and stress. And the best we can do is make them less bad. (laughs) It was this deficit model that said adolescents, because of their biology, are dangerous to other people and endangered themselves because of their unrelenting manifestation of hormonal challenges. And it's just going to be bad. There's nothing nothing we can do about it. Right. So the idea was, good in adolescence was to make them less bad. Okay. And that didn't jive with my observations, Mm. completely unsystematic, of the young people I knew or saw in my college classrooms or uh, my graduate school classrooms. Yeah. And so I became increasingly intrigued uh, with adolescent development. And at the time I began working in the area, there was very little work in the area. It was mostly looking at the implications of puberty for a positive or problematic development. And through a long series of experiences, both in class and with professors, I became very interested in how young people, through working with the significant others in their world, could be a major source of their own development. And if we aligned the strengths of young people, which I believed existed, with the resources for positive development in their world, those relationships could lead to thriving. And that it wasn't biologically necessary that uh, people were less bad to be good, 
but that we could actually promote things in people that would be valued by themselves and other people. Things that ended up being those seeds of positive development mm. I talk about in the book. But that took years for me to discover. <laughs> you didn't come right out of the gate with that. I didn't know that when I began, but that's what led me to get interested in adolescence as a period of, of development. And when I started, there were relatively few people. There wasn't even a journal wow. devoted to uh, adolescence. And eventually some came out, but uh, there was no organization, no scholarly organization. So eventually I worked with other people uh, to form the Society for Research in Adolescence. And I became the editor of their flagship journal, Journal of Research in Adolescence. Wow. And from my very first editorial in that journal and through the six years I edited it, I spoke about how adolescents could be positive producers of their own thriving. One of the things that early on in your book, um, kind of in line with what you were just talking about, which I thought was really, really great idea, was you write that actually sometimes being a difficult child is actually an advantage. And you talk about a, a tribe um, in Kenya called the Maasai in Kenya and Tanzania, um, and they had, you know, easy versus difficult kids. Behavioral styles, temperaments. Yeah, 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 yeah. So in, in, in the U.S., people would describe temperament through things like uh, biological regularity. And if you were regular in biological uh, characteristics like sleeping and eating and toileting, that made right. it easy for your parent to take care of you. Okay, but it was sure. completely unpredictable about when you went to the bathroom, how much you ate, when you slept, mm. and if your mood was not positive, but when you woke up, you were yelling and screaming and you couldn't be uh, placated or uh, uh, diverted, that would make it difficult. Whereas easy kids would wake yeah. up in a positive mood, could be uh, uh, distracted from cranking out. Yeah, yeah. They go along with the program. They don't like resist everything. Right. Yeah. In, in the United States, the research indicated that kids were either easy or difficult. But remember my idea that that human development is a relational phenomenon. It's person context relations. Yeah. These ideas were studied easy and difficult were studied in middle class, primarily white samples where the mothers would go out to work and not just work at anything. The samples that were studied were the mothers were college graduates. Some of them were lawyers, physicians, mm. PhDs. So they needed to get to sleep because they were going into a classroom, an operating room, a laboratory the next day. So a difficult kid would really break up their patterns. However, when you go to other settings where the context is different, yeah. a, a difficult child is, might be irrelevant. If, you're, if a mother just figures that her lot of life is to adapt herself around the kid, whatever the kid is, or at times when there are resource restrictions, it may be the squeaky wheel that gets the grease. Mm -hmm. And we actually saw that in the studies I reported in the book. Wow, that's so interesting. I think, yeah, it's just like it's an example of how we think it's so obvious sometimes how our kids should be or whatever, um, or why can't they just kind of like get with the program or follow along and, but actually sometimes like whatever. Think they're... of what would have happened if Bill Gates went with a program and, yeah. stayed in, <laughs> and stayed at Harvard and graduated or Steve Jobs or Mark Zuckerberg. So, okay, you then went and conducted a study about this. And you went to all these kind of um, programs, sports programs, 4-H clubs, church-affiliated programs, and it was longitudinal. So you followed followed people. You studied 7,000 kids from 42 states from the fifth grade to the 12th grade. Okay, yeah. And uh, although the study had limitations, which I'll discuss in a second, what we found is just what I had had that first inkling back when I first opened up a book and saw how people were discussing adolescence, yeah. that if you align the strengths of young people with the resources that exist in their key settings, 
homes, schools, community programs. Those young people will thrive. And we found that five attributes were uh, useful to, for defining thriving. Competence, not just academic competence, although that's important, but also social competence and vocational competence. About 60% of all kids who've been enrolled in high school full-time in the United States work part-time. So given that, kids need to be competent in, in the workplace. Yeah. And then they have to have confidence in themselves. They have to have the belief that they are a kid who has the ability to succeed at valued activities. But they also need to know that they can't do it themselves. They have to have positive connections with family, with uh, coaches, teachers, mentors, friends, co-workers. And they need to work with these people in ways that reflect moral centeredness and character and appropriate behaviors. They need to understand that there's right and wrong and be committed to doing the right thing. And finally, we found that a fifth C was important, character or compassion. That is a young person who cared about doing for others what they had, that the world didn't end with themselves, but they wanted to reach out and help other people, sort of a social justice idea. We also found that when we uh, saw high levels of competence, confidence, connection, character, and caring in kids, a sixth C emerged, contribution. Young people mm. actively made positive contributions to their family, to themselves, keeping themselves healthy and fit, to their schools, to their communities. And as we looked at older kids, these contributions became transformed into positive civic engagement. They wanted to make a positive impact on the institutions of social justice and institutions of civil society. Now, that was good work. It lasted 10 years with my collaborator, Jackie Lerner, it was sponsored by National 4-H Council, which is, 4-H is still the nation's largest youth-serving organization. Wow. So of the 7,000 kids, 2,500 were 4-H, but the then president of 4-H, Don Floyd, had the vision that we want to make this study a vision of all America's kids. So we went yeah. beyond. However, Issues of, even though we were very well funded by National 4-H Council, Jackie worked very hard to get us a representative sample. The sample wasn't representative. We had too few kids of color, too few kids from urban areas, and too few kids of low SES. Therefore, in the study we just got funded to do, which is to replicate the 4-H study, which we were will be beginning this fall, and we're asking people from 4-H from across the United States, if they'd like to collaborate with us, we will oversample for those attributes of kids that were deficient in the first sample. Because here's the thing, positive youth development is a general term, but unless we study diverse kids, we will never know how positive development is understood and instantiated in diverse samples. So that's our goal in the new 4-H study, which we're calling the replication study. By the way, we're also recontacting the original sample to see how they're faring in their late 20s. Wow. And we're calling that the reconnection study. Oh, that is going to be so think interesting. About it. These are people now in their late 20s who are building their lives in the middle of a pandemic. What is happening yeah. with them? It's going to sure be interesting to find out, huh? Well, invite me back in a couple of years and I'll tell you how that works out. This is another thing I really thought was interesting. In the book here, you talk about liking what your teenager likes, uh, which sounds really simple when you just say it like that, but it's actually a little more um, complicated because if you kind of go overboard, then your child will start to feel like it's an intrusion or like you're sort of like taking over. So how do you support and feel like, you know, you want to get involved and be, you know, supporting your teen and what they're interested in and liking, but without them feeling like you're kind of overstepping? So this would be a great time for me to call on my grandchildren who happen to be here. Of course, <laughs> they have a facility 
with electronic media that I still don't have. My seven-year-old granddaughter can pick up a phone, a laptop, a, a stationary computer, uh, a Chromebook, and begin working with it <laughs> and begin figuring out how to access the web and different websites and yep. how to put things together. My three-year-old, she's actually not three until uh, October, my three-year-old granddaughter, you know, she moves like this, uh, your radio folks will be able to see it, but she's paging through the pages of her mom's cell phone to find out yep. the, the, the site she wants to go to. And she, she's not yet three. So my my point is parents should find a reason to be enthusiastic about what their kids are doing, assuming it's a wholesome, appropriate thing, and learn from their kids. Say, wow, that sounds really interesting. Can you tell me what's good about that? Can you teach me what you know? Let the kid be an active agent in showing the parent that what they're doing is valuable and could engage the parent. That sort of mutuality of respect and engagement can be a great resource of bonding between a parent and a kid. And so uh, the key is sort of always making sure they're in the driver's seat a little bit or that you're like deferring to them. Um, Well, no, no, actually not that they're in the driver's seat. I wouldn't say that, but that you find value in your kid's perspective that you reinforce that they have agency and the ability to define their world in a way that you respect. That's the key. Not, you know, you're not going to say to the kid, okay, uh, do whatever you want. Seven years old and here, drive my car. (laughs) Of course, my seven year old granddaughter wants to drive my car all the time when I drive her home, but uh, I'm not going to put her (laughs) in the driver's seat, but I talk to her about, why uh, she needs to learn some rules about driving and how when she gets older in the state, it's going to be a while at 16 and a half to get a license here in Massachusetts, uh, that I, if I'm still around, will be glad to teach her and make her a driver and even share my car with her by then. Probably by then I won't be able to drive. She'll have to be your chauffeur. That'll be great. (laughs) So one aspect of that is praise, uh, which can be hard, I think. for Praise parents. and support. Praise and support, Andy. So this, uh, I, thought, I like this section that you have on productive praise. Uh, on page 61 of your book, you write, find some aspect of the work that reflects one of your child's strengths and then emphasize it. And you can also note how her work has influenced you. Yeah, that, that's exactly my point. You affirm that they have authentic, valuable skills that you're proud of and that you would like to see them embellish and grow. Yeah, well, I think this is really savvy. And um, I think it's not it's not the maybe the instinct, you know, because the instinct is to say you're really good, that good job, you know, um, wow, looks good. And praise, I think, can be difficult. And there's all people like uh, saying saying different things about how you should be doing it and how you shouldn't be doing it. But I thought this was really kind of a nice way of thinking about it, of, you know, focusing on like the, the strength that it emphasizes, like whatever it was that they work, worked hard on it or that they are really, work, it shows their creativity or that it shows their whatever so athleticism. Let me, let me when my younger son was late elementary, beginning of uh, middle school, he was really into skateboarding. Yeah. And he broke his share of bones, et cetera. I bet I, yeah, that'll happen. And uh, I certainly wasn't going to get on the skateboard. Right. But I, I said, gee, you know, uh, it might be good if you skateboarded around here so that I can see how you're doing and, and appreciate the skills that you have, because it looks like you're very talented and I'll never do it. His name is Jared. I'll never do it, Jared, but I'd like to, to see what you can do. He goes, well, I can't do it here, dad, because there's no, and he gave me the words, there were no boxes, etc." Mm. I go, well, you know, maybe we could get some lumber and we could work together on building stuff that you could use. And I said, 
we have a very we have a basement that's 101 feet long. Wow. So I said maybe even in the winter when you can't do it outside, we could bring it downstairs and you could do it inside and invite your friends over. He thought this was the greatest idea. What did he do? He learned how to build yeah, things. Right. We still have the boxes he built in our garage because now he's married with his own kid. He doesn't have room for them. So we'll have them there for when my granddaughter, who's three, gets the skateboard. Because <laughs> he's, he's intent on teaching her how to do it. So, so that's what I mean. Find something or create something of value that you can affirm in your child, show them you value that. And rather than say skateboarding is reckless and you're getting in yep. people's ways, find ways of affirming that what your kid is doing is manifesting a valuable skill. It's so easy to just look at it as a waste of time. And why, are you, why do you do that? And why do you waste so much time on that? And like, what about your homework, you know, um, and the things that you see as important? Um, and so you know, you make it sound uh, really easy in this example, but it's really hard. I think when your kid comes to you with, you know, something that they're doing, that's like not part of the program, you know, that's... Well, and the hardest thing now, especially, you know, even before the pandemic, children in America's greatest waking activity was screen time. Yeah. Not going out and playing pick up softball with their friends or yeah. skateboarding or whatever. Now in the pandemic, it's a necessity to survive, to be mm -hmm. able to Zoom like we're doing right now, or to use screen time to learn and to also interact with people. The, the, it's your only the connection irony to the of the world. pandemic is yeah. the greatest thing that kids need to keep them thriving and moving in a positive direction are positive social relationships. That, that key asset in their lives is the very thing which will endanger them now. So we need to create, parents need to be especially creative now to find value in screen time. Mm. And one of them, one of that can be co-learning. I constantly talk to my, at least my older grandkids and my children who are all in their early 30s about what they can teach me about how I can access things online. We are here with Dr. Richard M. Lerner talking about his groundbreaking research, which reveals that everything you think you know about teenagers is wrong. Here's what's coming up in the second half of the show. You don't want to be in a position where you're saying, you can't make this decision without me. All life, the very nature of life is relationships. What I'm talking about is a lifelong balancing act because this happens when your kids get to be 30 and 40. My, Jared right now is thinking of selling his existing house and buying a new one because he's having another baby and they need more room. Sure. They have enough income to get a, a somewhat larger house. But how do you shop for a house in a pandemic? My wife and I have ideas, but you have to sure. sort of <laughs> develop a conversation where they say, oh, and what's your idea, Dad? Because if you just say, look, here's how you need to do this, that's the surest way, even in a 30-something, to shut down the conversation. Want to hear the full interview? Sign up for a subscription today. You get unlimited access to all the interviews I've conducted. It's completely affordable. And your subscription helps support the work we do here at Talking to Teens. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.